The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are simply that, opinions. All are presumed innocent until proven otherwise in a court of law. Sensitive topics are discussed. Discretion is advised. In January 2022, Boston police officer John O'Keefe was found dead in the snow outside of a friend's house in Canton, Massachusetts. Prosecutors say Karen Reed, O'Keefe's girlfriend, hit him with her car and left him to die while she claims that she's being framed. As jurors take in every piece of evidence and testimony, they are tasked with determining if Karen Reed is a killer or the scapegoat in an elaborate cover-up. I'm Vinnie Politan, and on this week's Court TV podcast, you'll hear Massachusetts State Police Lieutenant Kevin O'Hara detail where John O'Keefe was found and what evidence was discovered at the scene. Have a listen. This is the Court TV podcast with Vinnie Politan. All right, Mr. Lally, who's your first witness? You're on the call, uh, excuse me, the Commonwealth would call Lieutenant Kevin O'Hara to the stand. Okay. Forgive me, Your Honor. Anytime you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Morning, sir. Could you uh, please state your name and spell your last name for the jury? It's uh, Kevin O'Hara, O H A R A. And uh, how are you employed, sir? I'm a lieutenant with the Massachusetts State Police. And uh, how long in total have you been? Just over 22 years. And how long have you held the rank of lieutenant? Four and a half years. And what is your current assignment within the Massachusetts State Police? I'm the team commander for the State Police Special Emergency Response Team, which is also known as CERT. And the CERT team within the State Police, uh, approximately how many members of, of that unit are? We have 61 team members, four of which are full time, including myself. The other 57 have other primary duty assignments, and CERT is an additional duty for them. Now, generally speaking, what are sort of the duties and responsibilities, or what is, what is it that the CERT unit within the state police does? Uh, CERT is the primary search and rescue team for the state police. We conduct lost, missing person searches, evidence searches. We do security or crowd control at large scale events, such as the 4th of July, the Boston Marathon, Gillette Stadium. Dignitary security. And how long uh, has it been? Uh, how long have you been assigned to that particular unit? Since 2014. Now, were you working with that unit on January 29th, 2020? Uh, yes, I was, sir. And at some point in the afternoon on that day, were you contacted uh, by Lieutenant Brian Tully of the station? Uh, yes, at 2:32 p.m., Lieutenant Tully gave me a phone call. Now, as far as Lieutenant Tully is concerned. Were you with him, or he's familiar with what units uh, he supervises? Uh, yes, I know he's the supervisor for the Norfolk County State Police Detective Unit. Now, if you could, describe to the jury um, sort of the process uh, by which uh, your particular unit is, is activated. Is that an instantaneous thing, or, or how does that work? Normally, we'll receive a, a courtesy phone call, which is what I received from Lieutenant Tully, seeing if we were available, if this was we had members that could respond today for an incident he had ongoing. I told him we would be available. He then has to submit a uh, request through his chain of command, which is the Division of Investigative Services. 
I also have to submit a request up my chain of command, which is through field services, to get approval on my end, has to be approved by the special operations commander, which is a major. And depending on the request, it may even go above his level to the lieutenant colonel who is in charge of the division of field services. So that initial call that you received about 2.32 in the afternoon, how would you, how would you characterize that, that first call? Again, I'd say it was more of a courtesy notification, just to make sure we weren't on another assignment, that we had members who could respond that day. Obviously, there was uh, the weather issue that day, making sure members could respond to the scene. And the weather issue that day, what, what kind of weather issue was that? Uh, it was a blizzard. I think most areas had received between 18 to 20 inches of snow. And as far as that initial phone call with Lieutenant Tully, as far as what was described to you, as far as the, the situation that you're responding to, or, or what if anything? He said they were conducting a death investigation on the town of Canton, and he was looking for cert assistance with an evidence search. And how did you respond to that request that, on that initial point? I told them we would, would have members that would be able to respond and that I would start working on the approval process, looking out my own window. I hadn't been outside my house that day. I had large snow drifts at the end of my driveway. I, I told them building a roster and having members clear their driveway at least an hour plus on our response time. And following that initial conversation, did Lieutenant tell me to uh, reach back out to you at some point? Yeah, I'm not positive if he called me or if I called him. I think after I'd cleared my driveway, I spoke to my captain just to make sure, see what the status was on the approval process on our end. He said we were cleared on our end, so either Lieutenant Tully called me or I may have called him because I was getting nervous that now that my driveway was clear that the town plow was going to come back and bury the end of my driveway again. So I'm not sure who called who, but I called him and told him we were cleared through the Division of Field Services. He also told me that we were cleared on his end. Uh, the approval requests have been approved. And do you know approximately what time of day it was that you had that second conversation with Lieutenant Tully? It was probably about quarter of four because we sent out an alert to our team at 348 telling them that we were authorized to respond to Canton. And as far as your team was concerned, can you speak a bit about sort of that, that process as far as the response and who was to respond and how you were able to sort of pull together the body to respond? So CERT is broken up. Uh, we're geographically dispersed across the state. So we have an East team, West team. I had reached out to a supervisor from the West team, someone I knew who I wouldn't request to drive that far in, in the snowy conditions to set up a roster for us. So he sent out an alert to the team at 2.53, uh, requesting an availability list. I told him to just confirm that the people responding either had a, a truck or some kind of four-wheel drive vehicle to respond. And where, where was it that you were told, or where did you eventually respond to? Uh, Lieutenant Tully told us that we were going to Fairview Road in Canton. And from the time that you cleared your driveway, response from your higher-ups, um, well, what time was it uh, that you left, or how long did it take you to get uh, from, from your home to 34 Fairview? Well, like I stated, uh, the alert went out authorizing the team to start responding at 348. I got the exact address via text from Lieutenant Tully at 410. We sent out another alert message at 417, just reminding people to bring shovels, brooms, rakes, etc. I left my house at 4.13 in the afternoon, and I got on scene at 4.56, so it took me 43 minutes to drive there. And from your house to, to that location, Ken, about how absent sort of the weather, how long a drive was that going? Probably 20 minutes, sir. <laughs> and when you respond, um, how many other members of your unit were able to respond or respond to the scene? Uh, initially, we dispatched eight members, including myself. Only seven of us made it to the scene. One of the members could not get off his street. His, the end of his street had been plowed in by his town, and he had called his town DPW to try to get some assistance, but he was not able to make it to the scene. So we only had seven, again, after we initially started eight, which did kind of shift some of the dynamics of how we ran the search on scene. And um, getting to that in a moment, when you first arrived on scene, uh, if anyone else preceded your arrival, who was on scene? 
Just one other trooper from CERT, Trooper Jay Boussoulet, was on scene. I believe he arrived two minutes prior to, to my arrival. Could you say that name again and spell it for us, Yes, please? sir. It's uh, Trooper Jason Boussoulet. It's B-A, excuse me, B-E-A-U-S-O-L-E-I-L. Thank you. You're welcome. And Lieutenant Rao, when you arrived on scene, uh, where did you park in relation to the house and where was uh, Trooper Boussoulet in relation to the house? Uh, Trooper Boussoulet was just past the driveway of the house, so just north of the driveway. I parked almost at the end of the driveway of Fairview. As you recall, um, at some point your, your attention was directed to an area with a black hole and a fire hydrant, is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. And do you recall which direction uh, either or both of, of your vehicle and we were facing away from the flagpole originally. Eventually, we moved uh, to Rabusle's vehicle back towards the flagpole. Just we wanted some extra headlights to light up the scene, the area we would be working in. Now, Lieutenant Tully, was he on scene when you arrived? Uh, he was not. And at some point, did you reach out to him? Yes, I gave him a call. He stated he was just leaving Canton PD, he would be on scene in about five minutes. That was probably around five o'clock. Now, as far as uh, the house that you were parked in front of and as far as the residences on that street, who, if anyone else, uh, as far as neighbors or anything like that, or people from the house did you see outside the house while at any point in time? Uh, we didn't see anyone outside the houses. Uh, a resident of Fairview exited briefly after we were first on scene, but that was the only person we saw. No, he was, if you look at the house, there's, you would consider two front doors, one on the, one closer to the garage, which would maybe be a mudroom or a den. Uh, adult male exited from that door, had a hooded sweatshirt on. He asked us if we were here for what had happened earlier. We said yes, and he walked back inside the house. Now, as far as the, um, you mentioned a bit about the, the snow, as far as the, the roadway conditions of, what, if anything, did you know or observe in regard to, to the roadway and, and how it had been treated the plow prior to your The plow had really only cleared the center of the road. There was a good three to four foot snow drift coming off each side of the road, so maybe enough for two vehicles to pass, but not cleared, uh, excuse me, cleared curb to curb. And as far as Lieutenant Tully arriving on scene around five, um, at some point, did he, what, if anything, where, where did he he had ins uh, instructed us that the death investigation involved a motor vehicle. He told us where the motor vehicle was believed to have been parked and wanted us to search from that area south towards the flagpole fire hydrant. Now, as far as this type of search was concerned, had you, uh, what if any experience did you have uh, doing this type of search in, in conditions? In blizzard conditions, we've really never done evidence searches like this. We've done missing person searches we've gone out to, but for evidence searches, nothing like this. Something if a scene could be secured, we really wouldn't respond in a situation like this unless we really needed to. Now, as far as the, the search that your team does, if you could, um, was it typical or not typical as far as um, conducting a search of an area that had already been um, gone over by another agency or Yeah, we're a stage two response, so pretty much every search we've ever done has been previously searched. We're never really the first person to search an area. And can you describe sort of, the, um, I guess, sort of the difference between what you do as far as searching is concerned and, and sort of looking or making observations or things of that? Well, I think our training is a lot different than maybe the regular patrolman or trooper responding. There's not much training provided anymore in the academies. So we do extensive training through a lot of the search and rescue groups that we're a part of, which would be the National Association for Search and Rescue, which is NASAR. We do search and rescue initial actions. We do line searching, managing lost person incidents. We do multiple trainings a month with a team, which is different than what other personnel would get. I think traditionally, looking back to even my time before I was a member of CERT, 
a search would be, you go this way, I'll go that way. There was really no methodical approach to the search. And as far as your training is concerned, as it relates to this particular search, what, what if any sort of uh, methodical approach did you develop, or, or what, did, what did you employ in this particular <clears throat> We gridded off or marked off the area Lieutenant Tully thought would be the best area for us to search. So we had a starting point and an end point. Once all the members got on scene, we set up a line search, or what we would call a grid search, which again would just be a slow, methodical search with all of us working in unison, moving through the area. And about how big an area was it that you initially sort of set up? Uh, it was just over 50 feet, I believe, from the front door, which is the left door, looking at the house from the street to the fire hydrant, I believe it was 59 feet. Was that length or width? That is length. And as far as uh, the width of the area that you were searching, about what kind of area were you searching? It's about three to four feet was the snow drift coming off the curb. Now, as far as the information that you received prior to conducting the search, uh, were there any items that were specifically identified as, as far as items that you might be looking for, or what if anything was given you? Yeah, Lieutenant Tully had informed us that the victim, in this case, was struck by a vehicle. He believed there would be broken pieces of taillight in the area. He also stated the victim was missing his sneaker. So he asked us to look, search for both, uh, both of those items. And, sir, at some point, um, did you ask Lieutenant Tully any questions uh, about uh, the vehicle in question or, or anything in relation to that? After we had found a, one or two of the pieces with taillight, I asked him if we knew how big of how much damage was to the taillight or if he had a photo that we could get of the taillight. And what, if anything, did he tell you? He told us at that time the vehicle was being towed back to Canton PD, so he did not have a photo to show us. And at any point, did he make any reference to who was coming along with the tow at Canton PD? He said uh, Sergeant Buchanan and Trooper Proctor were following the vehicle back to Canton PD. Describe for the jury sort of the process uh, and what kind of tools or implements uh, you use and sort of how that, that search was done. So like I said, we moved Trooper Boussoulet's vehicle to face the scene to give us some extra, use his headlights for extra lighting for the scene. All the team members also put on a, a headlamp, which would basically just be like a hiking headlamp. We had, all had shovels. We had a couple of rakes, the smaller garden rakes, just to kind of eat, help us sift through the snow. And I also had a small push broom to move the snow around as well. As you mentioned, sort of the headlamps and moving the vehicle as far as the, the headlights on, on the area that you were searching, what was the visibility and what, what was the lighting conditions around that area at that time you were conducting? It was poor lighting. There really wasn't much as far as what we felt enough for street lighting. But with the headlamps, I mean, we had decent visibility. So when you first arrived on the scene, about four fifty. Yes, it was, sir. And it remained dark while you were still on scene? Yes, sir. And in the area that you were looking, uh, your testimony, there wasn't much overhead sort of ambient lighting or street lighting in that area, as far as you recall? Uh, nothing that really helped the search. So the area that you were searching was in the area of the fire hydrant, is that correct? We started almost directly across from the front door and moved south towards Chapman Street, towards the fire hydrant. And to be clear, as far as the area that you were searching with uh, shovels and the other uh, different implements to sort of sift through the snow, um, where was your focus as far as the street versus the, the front wall? Our right flank was on the curb, and then we moved out across the street from there. So and we were lined almost shoulder to shoulder as we moved down, as we moved south through the area we were searching. You're primarily searching or entirely searching along the, the roadway, is that correct? Correct, sir. And as far as some point did you, through the course of, of sort of shoveling it and the removal of snow from that area, did you approach or come in contact with uh, the area of grass in front of us? We did as uh, 
one of the members who was working along the curb, he, he did started to clear some of the grass upon the front lawn, yes, sir. What, if any issues uh, did you and the other encounter when you got to sort of the grass? It was very difficult to clear the snow. I don't think we had very good visibility on what, what we were moving, even with the push broom and the rake. It was very difficult to definitively say we, we had cleared the lawn properly. So we didn't focus too much of our efforts on that area. Now, you referenced that um, only seven members of your unit were able to respond because one got stuck in the, in the snow in the end of the street. Is that correct? Correct, sir. And uh, that had some impact as far as documentation of the scene. Is that correct? Correct. Normally on a search, if I'm the overall, as a team leader, I would run what you consider a command post or be the incident commander for cert. I would stay behind the line and kind of document our efforts, but because this was such a small search area, it wasn't really an issue because I, I, we weren't breaking people off into teams, no one was out of my sight line, and we had multiple detectives on scene that were able to fill that role for me. And so to that point, as far as um, the seven members from your unit, in addition to the seven members from your unit, with anyone else present during the course of I believe there was five other members. I believe there were only two that I recognized from the state police, so I'm not sure who the other three were. They were Canton detectives or Canton patrolmen, but they were all dressed in civilian, you know, plain, plain clothes. And as far as documentation uh, for the scene, what, if anything, was, was done with reference As we began to find evidence, I spoke to Lieutenant Tully and just confirmed that he was going to document all, everything we were recovering via photograph and evidence log. As far as <coughs> documented were photos taken by Lieutenant Tully? Yes, they were, sir. And the items that were photographed, uh, were they photographed prior to when anyone was sort of touching them or moving them or placing them, other than those uh, sort of related to the search effort? Correct. As soon as we found anything deemed as evidence, we stopped our search efforts until they were documented by Lieutenant Tully. And in reference to your search efforts, I found multiple pieces of red and clear taillight. And uh, where were they in relation to sort of the grid or the area that you had set up? They were in, on the street in between the flagpole and the fire hydrant. And sir, in addition to the, uh, the pieces of uh, red and, and clear plastic uh, taillight that you uh, uncovered, um, do you know approximately how many pieces of that you were able to I believe maybe six or seven pieces. And uh, how big or how small or did they range in size as far as the pieces that you located? There was three larger pieces, two red, one clear, and then a couple of smaller pieces. In addition to the pieces of red and clear plastic taillight that were uncovered during the search process, what if any other items of interest uh, were located? Uh, we found a sneaker. It was same location, generally it was in between the flagpole and the fire hydrant. The sneaker was flush up against the curb and it was upside down. I think we had found one piece of tail light prior to the sneaker and then after we found the sneaker we found a couple, few more additional pieces of tail light. Now with reference to the sneaker and each of those pieces of red and clear plastics, where were they in relation to the snow that was being dug through? Where were they in relation to the crime? Can you repeat the end of that, sir? Sure. With reference to each of the items of evidence that you've been talking about, whether it be sneaker or the, the, the red and clear plastic, um, where were they in relation to the snow that you were digging into? Where were they in relation to the, the asphalt surface? Uh, close to the curb, as we started digging originally, the snow drift, the snow pack was pretty solid from where the plow had kind of cleared to. So once we were able to move through that, we started getting into fresh, undisturbed snow, started moving through that, which was a lot easier to move at that point. And all the items we found were, were close to, to the curb. And so my question also, sir, is, is sort of how deep within uh, the 
the stone that you were digging was, was it each of those items? They were all found at ground level. And as far as the area that you were searching um, beyond the <coughs> snow drifts and, and plowing towards the middle of the road, how would you characterize that snow as far as you were observing? Footprints, tire tracks, or anything in that area where you were digging through and finding these items? No, we did not see anything, sir. Like I said, it was all all fresh undisturbed snow once we got past where the uh, plow had cleared up to. Now, as far as this search being conducted sort of physically, is, is, is you mentioned there's some sort of uh, line that's set up, is that correct? Correct, sir. Can you describe to the jury sort of how that line was set up, um, what were the different functions in different parts of the line, and where were you in relation? So like I stated, we had a, what we consider our right flank stood on the curb closest to the house and then we moved left into the street. As we dug the snow out, it was originally inspected as they would pull their shovel out, make sure they didn't have anything in their shovel to the best of their ability. Then they would bring it out to the street. I was the left flank. They would dump it in the street, and I would sift through it at the end just to make sure there was no evidence that had come out to the street. Once I was positive nothing was in that snow, I would toss it onto the other side of the street. And we just continued that process as we moved south through that grid. Where the plow had touched, you know, clear to, I would say that was probably about a three plus foot in, in height. But as we moved into the snow itself, getting closer to the curb, that was in level with every, the rest of the area, what was on the front lawn, which was on the neighbor's lawn. So probably eight, maybe 18 inches of snow. Uh, after Lieutenant Tully showed up, kind of in, informed us where we were going to search, we moved Trooper Boussoulet's vehicle at 520, and that's when the rest of the team started to show up, right around 521, 524. A couple other members with extended response time showed up a little bit after that, but all members were on scene by 541. We had already started the process before they had all arrived on scene, and we were complete by 615. We started to wrap up and clear the area. As far as the wrapping up, uh, how was that decision arrived at and, and, and sort of what, what led to that decision? So after we found the sneaker and a couple of additional pieces of taillight, we moved south for, I'd say, over five feet, maybe closer to eight to ten feet without finding any other pieces of evidence. So uh, Lieutenant Tully and I had a conversation. He was very satisfied that we had found everything we were going to locate at that time and we decided to suspend the search. And what was, um, as far as you were concerned, uh, with weather conditions and everything that had gone on in order to locate that one, what was sort of your thought process in, in relation to um, any sort of continuation of the search at, at some later time? I told Lieutenant Tully, I mean, we'll do a, a debrief at the end, we'll go over probability of detection, how I feel, whether we would have found everything that was there, I told him that there was a good chance we did not find everything. I said if he wanted us to come back in the daylight, which would give us better lighting to search, or after a couple of days, the weather was supposed to warm up, if he wanted us to come back after there was some snow melt, just to reach out to me, and we would come back. And as far as um, suspending the search at that point, was that something that was your decision that you had with Lieutenant Tully? No, that was in consultation with Lieutenant Tully. Correct, sir. At any point in time that you were on scene, did you, uh, do you know uh, either Sergeant Buchanan or Trooper Proctor? Uh, yes, I know both of them, sir. And at any point in time that you were on scene, did you see either Sergeant Buchanan or Trooper Proctor uh, in the area of Bridgeport Fairview during the entire time you were there? No, they were not on scene. So the other sort of troopers that you had mentioned around, they were not there, correct? They were not there, no, sir. Now, as far as the securing of evidence, um, how was that done? 
generally speaking in relation to um, searches that your unit conducts and how it is done in this so we don't recover evidence, we'll, we'll stop and halt our search. Sometimes we've been waiting for crime scene to show up for two hours before we've continued to search. So once we found the first piece of, of taillight, again, I conferred with Lieutenant Tully, asked him if he was documenting it and recovering everything. He said, stated he was. Once, he, once we felt comfortable that he had done that properly, we then continued the search. So once you get sort of that, He is not, no. And is that typical as far as how the searches will be conducted? Correct, yes. Yeah, they let me run the search the way I, I deem best. Sir, in addition to photographs, uh, what, if anything else, was uh, done to, uh, to document the scene? We had one of our members use a handheld GPS, which we use a Garmin 64ST. And he marked each item we found, which we then can upload later to a map, which we did later that evening. If you could just describe to the jury that process as far as mapping is concerned and sort of how uh, well the positioning system or GPS is, is utilized in, in creating that. Correct. So the Garmin GPS we use, it connects to four different satellites to give you a best range of your location. There obviously is some range error involved with GPSs, but he was able to stamp three of the items, or three pieces of the tail light, but as he was marking those items on his GPS, they kept, because they were in such close proximity, they were almost marking directly on top of each other, so he only marked three of them because it was just going to clutter the map as we continued if he were to mark all the pieces we located. <coughs> They were the larger pieces, sir. Yes. Sir, I'm showing you a series of 24 photographs. I should just look at those briefly. Um, and just, I'm going to ask you in a moment if you recognize them. Do you yes, recognize uh, what's in those photographs, sir? Uh, yes, sir. It's the uh, area we searched and some of the evidence we, that we recovered. Thank you. Your Honor, Commonwealth will seek to introduce and admit as the next exhibits. Any objection, Ms. Tianetti? There is no objection, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Mark, may we approach briefly? All right. Oh, I'm sorry. She needs to have her attention on the mark. I'm sorry. I have exhibits 111 through 134. Sure, is it's very important that we keep our record straight. It will be important for you during the deliberations that we do this. Sometimes it takes a while. We're fortunate we've got such a great court reporter here to take care of this for us. But sometimes it takes a while. Um, I caution counsel that maybe you can all work together so that we don't do this. Um, take up any extra time. All right, do you need those photos back, Mr. Lally? Yes, 111, sir. And uh, if you could um, describe to the jury, and if, if you uh, you hear that later this morning, what if anything of significance you observe in this particular photo? Uh, this is the flagpole in front of the house. As you move south, this appears to be one of the pieces of taillight that we recovered. And, sir, Ms. Gilman, if you could zoom back out a little. Now, as far as when you're conducting the search and when the actual searching process is ongoing, what was the weather doing while you were doing that? Yes, because of the air conditioning. So you need to speak up really loudly if you don't have a microphone in front of you. And so, Lieutenant, during the course of, of the process as you're conducting this search, what was the weather doing, and is that something that you can observe in this photo? Uh, it was still snowing, and you can see some of the snowflakes falling here by the flagpole. And as far as the wind was concerned, what has any impact did the wind have on the course of the search that you were conducting? It was windy, but it really didn't impact how, how we were searching through the area. And, sir, if I could direct your attention to the next photograph on the floor. Okay. Uh, yes, it is. Sort of a different perspective of this same uh, area that you were talking about in the last photograph, is that correct? Correct. If I could have the next photograph, 113. Again, what's up on the screen? Is that what you have before you at 113? Uh, yes, it is. And again, sort of a closer perspective to the piece of daylight that you were referring to, is that correct? Correct. You really have to speak up. Again, Lieutenant, what's up on the screen? Is that what you have before you? Yes, it is. Um, and again, a closer up image of that same piece of taillight as it was observed uh, when you covered it. Correct. And you can see right here to the left of the taillight that is the molding of a shovel. So this piece of taillight was picked up by one of the team members' shovels, and as they overturned it, you can see the tail light came up as they were searching through the area. And this is kind of the markings of the shovel itself. Um, and the next photograph is still. I, I, I that. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have to turn the air conditioning off for this. I, 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 we can't hear you at all. The issue is I'm trying to move away from the podium. I understand. So we need to turn the air conditioning off so that we can hear you. Yes, please. And again, Lieutenant, uh, what's up on the screen? Is that what you have before you as the next exhibit? Yes, it is. And if you could describe to the jury what we're looking at in this case. You can see the piece of taillight that we recovered. And again, this is kind of the overturned snow from the shovel. And again, seeing the markings from the shovel from where it was overturned. And the uh, next photograph is still in. This particular piece, is this one of the larger or is this one of the smaller pieces that you were describing earlier in the testimony? This is one of the larger pieces, sir. And uh, as far as length or uh, size of it, if you know how, how much would you estimate it, uh, how big it was? 
guess a couple of inches, but well, I didn't measure it, sir. So this is the CERT members working through the area again, working on a, as a line through the grid formation. One of the things we stress is your critical separation, making sure you're close enough to each other that you won't miss a piece of evidence. If you're too far apart, you will miss that. A lot of times before searches, we will take an item of similar, similar size item that we're looking for and we'll space out because this was such a condensed search area. We just had the team members stand almost shoulder to shoulder as they, they search through the area. Maybe a little difficult to see from a distance, but right here, this is the uh, sneaker that we recovered. And as far as the airing of the curbing uh, that you indicated that the sneaker was recovered in relation to, where, where is that? It's flush up against the curb. Again, I'm sorry, using the, the laser oh, I apologize, sir. Right here, this would be the curbing right here. That's a closer photo of the sneaker. Sneakers in the bottom, right down here. And the uh, next photograph. And again, what if anything are we looking at in this photograph, sir? Again, you're looking at the sneaker. This is just a closer, zoomed-in photo, and this would be the curbing right here. And the sneaker, as it's portrayed in this particular photograph, is that as it was when it was recovered? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. You can see the curbing right here. The uh, next photograph. Now, as far as the sneaker was concerned, when it was covered, uh, where was the snow in relation to? Was it on, around, in? Where, where was the snow in relation to? The sneaker was completely buried. It wasn't until we started digging through the snow that we found the sneaker. Correct, sir. Or how it appeared when it was discovered at the Yes, sir. Next photograph, Ms. Kilman. Next photograph, Ms. Kilman. And, sir, in this photograph, if you could, using the laser pointer, um, draw the jury's attention to what, if anything, of significance you observed. This is Exhibit 125. It's the photo I have in front of me. This would be, might be difficult for them to see, but this is a clear piece of the tail light right here. And the next photograph. And again, sir, what is uh, depicted in this exhibit 126? See a little closer zoomed in version of the clear piece of tail light that was recovered. Correct, sir. The uh, next photograph, 127. What, if anything, are we looking at in this one? A different angle of the piece of clear taillight that was recovered. Difficult to see, but there's a piece of clear tail light right here. I can see with the photo in front of me, but I'm not sure if the jurors can see it from that distance, but there is a clear piece of tail light in this location. The 
Spanish Photograph 1.0. Again, there's a piece of clear tail light right in this location. Different piece of tail light than the, the one you were referring to previously in the prior exhibits? Uh, yes, sir. Again, there's a piece of clear tail light. Again, it might be difficult from the distance for the jurors, but it's in this location here. There's a larger piece of red tail light located on the ground in this location. And the next exhibit 132. What if anything are we looking at in 132? It's a closer photo of the same piece of tail light right here located on the ground. There's a small piece of taillight, I believe, in this location right here. And lastly, uh, exhibit 134. It's a small piece of taillight right on the ground right here in this location. John, may I approach? Yes. That, sir. Do you recognize those? Uh, yes, I do, sir. And what do you recognize those to be? This is the mapping system we use to map evidence we recover. So those diagrams created uh, pursuant to that mapping system? Uh, yes, they are. What's contained in those diagrams is that a fair and accurate portrayal of where items were recovered in relation to uh, various markers on scene at 34 Fairview on January 29th in the afternoon? Yeah, the marks showing on the map, they're a little offset, but that falls in the range of error with, with the handheld GPSs. May I approach again, Your Honor? Yes. I'll move to seek to introduce them later. No objection to the maps. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, Your Honor, with the court's permission, may I publish those to uh, one in each succession to the jury? Yes. Now, Lieutenant O'Hara, would you have it for you the first diagram, 135? Is that what's up on the screen? Uh, yes, it is, sir. And you mentioned something earlier in your testimony just now in regard to uh, sort of items being found in close proximity, creating some overlay with the GPS system. Is that correct? Correct, sir. And you mentioned uh, range of error. Is that correct? Correct, sir. Can you describe what the range of error is and, and how that impacts um, sort of how it's depicted in this, this particular diagram? So for GPS's typical range of error on a clear day is up to 16 feet. Obviously, we didn't have a clear day. We had atmospheric conditions, cloudy, snowy conditions. GPSs can be affected for their range accuracy by a few different things. One is the satellite geometry. As I said before, the GPSs connect to four different satellites. You also could have signal blockage. Blockage could occur from trees, buildings, bridges. Then you have atmospheric conditions, like I mentioned, and then you have the receiver end, any issues with your receiver end, which is actually the handheld GPS. Those would be the four, four main issues and why you may have a little offset on your GPS readings. But again, typically under clear sky conditions would be up to 16 feet. And sir, using the laser pointer, if you could uh, direct the jury's attention to what if any sort of significant markers or, or what if been 
marks uh, on this particular bag? I've listed as the command post, which is where my vehicle was parked. We have the address, which is the house, 34 Fairview. Then as you move further south, you'll see the first red plastic that we recovered, which again was a larger piece of red plastic. They're kind of stamped on top of each other, but you'll see the sneaker, you'll see a second red piece of plastic, and you'll see the fire hydrant all marked on the map. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Kemmon, if I could have the next diagram, please. Again, so what's up on the screen? Is that what you have before you? As you say, the 136? Uh, yes, it is. And uh, again, if you could describe uh, to the jury sort of what we're looking at in this diagram or, or what, if anything, is different between 136 and 135. We just changed the layering on the map just to make it a little easier to read. So we removed the taillight pieces, and now we just have the sneaker and the fire hydrant listed on the map here. And that area, as far as you were talking, um, sort of the, the concentration of the search was in the area of the flagpole and the fire hydrant, is that correct? Correct, sir. We, and we started closer to the, almost directly across from the front door. The evidence recovery all happened between the flagpole and the fire hydrant. And if you could, or if it's possible on this diagram that you have up on the screen, could you, using the laser pointer, direct the jury's attention to sort of where the search began and where the items uh, search would have begun right in this area. And as we move south, we started finding pieces of evidence right around here. And then the area that you went, um, about five or somewhere between five to ten feet, is that your testimony beyond when you started to not find any more items of evidentiary value? Is that correct? Correct. We had gone past the fire hydrant, had, hadn't found any other pieces of evidence for it's probably closer to eight to ten feet, and that's when we suspended the search. Sir, just using that laser pointer, if you could direct the jury's attention to that eight to ten feet, in which direction was that from the, uh, from the items of evidence? Heading south towards Chapman Street, so down in this location would be where we stopped. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, may I approach just to retreat? Yes. Now, <clears throat> sir, at any point in time that you were on scene, uh, were you able to um, look at or see any sort of um, photographs or any, any uh, images of the damage to the taillight? Uh, no, I was not. Uh, so fair to say that at the time that you're conducting your search on that particular afternoon, you weren't aware of how much taillight could be there or how much you might be looking for, correct? Correct. We did not know how, how much damage there was. <clears throat> now... So you talked a little bit about, uh, well, let me ask you this. As far as from your training and experience in relation to conducting these types of searches, are you familiar with a term known as POD? Correct. So that would be probability of detection. And uh, I believe you have referenced earlier in your testimony some variables that go into that uh, terminology. Is that correct? Correct. And can you describe uh, to the jury sort of what some of those variables are and, and how it related to this particular search? So probability of detection it winds up turning into a mathematical formula to make it simpler, or give us more of a baseline objective on how, how well we did search in the area. Covers 10 different categories. We'll rate those categories one through 10 on how we feel we did and kind of come up with a score to give just a baseline on what we think percentage wise we would have found the, the objects we're looking for. Those categories would include the terrain, any ha as number one, hazards would be two, Lighting would be three, weather would be four, vegetation would be five, which in this case would have been some of the grass we encountered as we got on the front lawn. As you continue on would be your spacing, which is, again is how the team members are separated as we're searching through the area, the tactics you're using, the area size, then the team composition, and then the last one is instinct and variables. And really the last two I think is what works best for us, what stands out most about our team is your team composition and the instincts just for the experience we have in searching. And so was it those variables that sort of led to the conclusion um, in conjunction yourself and Lieutenant Dully as far as to 
uh, cease searching at that particular point after you've gone eight to ten feet south of, of the, uh, the evidentiary items without locating any of any other evidentiary items. Correct, sir. Thank you. I have no further questions of this witness. Thank you, sir. All right. Cross examination. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Good morning, Lieutenant. Morning, sir. Sir, so you will agree with me that uh, it was Lieutenant Brian Tully who first called you at 2.32 p.m. to ask that your team come out for an evidence search? That's correct, sir. And you knew at that time that Lieutenant Tully was uh, the, well, he was in charge of the Norfolk County State Police Detectives Unit, correct? Correct, sir. Attached to the Norfolk County DA's office, correct? Correct, sir. And you also knew uh, Trooper Michael Proctor at that time? I knew who he is, yes, sir. Uh, and you knew that uh, Trooper Michael Proctor was in the same unit as Lieutenant Tully, correct? I don't know if he, I knew he was assigned to that office. I'm not sure, sure where he was assigned, sir. You've since found out that he is? Correct, sir. Now, you told Lieutenant Tully during that phone call at 2.32 p.m that you would make your team available that day, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, but at that point in time, uh, Lieutenant Tully specifically held you up, right? Because he didn't have authorization yet? Objection. Is that true? It's not. Okay. Uh, he told you that he did not have the green light, correct? He had not requested official uh, response from sir at that time. Okay. He so you were not authorized to respond at that time, correct? No, we, neither one of us are allowed to dispatch my team. We have to send up formal requests to get authorization to respond. All right. Now, uh, by 2.32 p.m. on January 29th, when you first spoke to Lieutenant Tully, snow had been falling consistently in Canton since the early hours, correct? The early morning hours? I would assume so, yes, sir. It um, wasn't my house. I'm sorry? It was at my house, so I would assume so, yes, sir. But you lived in Massachusetts at that correct. time, Correct, right? yes, I did, sir. And you weren't hours away when you were contacted by Lieutenant Tully, correct? I was not, no. All right. Uh, now, you were aware that uh, John O'Keefe's body was found on Brian Albert's lawn at 6.03 that morning? I believe when I spoke to Lieutenant Tully, he told me around 6.30. Okay. Uh, well, let's go with 6.30 then. Okay. Uh, so when you re received the call from Lieutenant Tully, snow would have been accumulated from 6 a.m., I'm sorry, 6.30 a.m. approximately to approximately 2.38 p.m., correct? Yes, sir. And so snow had been accumulating at that point when you first got the call for about eight hours after the body was found, correct? Correct, sir. Now, before you conduct a search, is it important for you to know in general terms the working theory of the police and the investigators in terms of what had happened at the scene? It's not. We're just, I want as detailed information on what we're looking for as far as the investigation is concerned. That's not interesting to me. Not, I'm not interested in that, those exact specifics. I just want to know where you would like us to search and what you need us to find. Right, but in order to know what you are seeking to find, uh, you'd need to learn from the investigators what they believed happened that would leave that evidence, correct? Correct, sir. He told us he was, we were looking for pieces of taillight from a vehicle. All right. You'd also want to know prior to getting to the scene who had access to the scene before you got there, would you not? I, I did not need to know that information, no, sir. And I did not ask that. All right. Is it important to maintain the integrity of a crime scene before it's searched or processed? Sometimes, but a lot of times when we're involved in searches, we might not be out for days later. If, they've, if search effort, efforts have been exhausted and they don't think any evidence can be recovered, we will go out to scenes that have been left unsecured for days on end. Sure, no, I, I understand that, but that wasn't my question. My question was, is it important to maintain the integrity of a crime scene before it's searched or processed? No, you can leave it unattended if you don't believe it'll be disturbed or anything will be taken, sir. Is it preferable to leave a crime scene unattended prior to searching it? 
No, I think they would have searched it before we arrived, yes, sir. Again, I'm going to ask if you would, please just respond oh, if I, to my if I, What my preference would be, sir, yes, I'd prefer that it was secured. Okay, that wasn't very difficult. Apologize. For the Jackson, Your Honor. So, no comments, Ms. Yes, Giannetti. Um, at the time that Lieutenant Tully first called you, were you aware that no one from law enforcement was controlling that crime scene? Jackson. I'll allow it. I was not aware of that, no, sir. Were you aware at that time that no one had been controlling it for about six or seven hours before you were called? I was not aware of that, sir. Were you aware that the scene had been abandoned by the police and investigators at about 7.50 in the morning? Objection. I'll allow it. I was not aware of that, sir. Were you aware that the scene was left open to the public for hours before you were asked to search? I was not aware of that. All right, in any case, when you got there, there was only one trooper on scene, and that was a trooper from your unit? Correct, sir. Beausoleil? Correct. Uh, nobody else was guarding the crime scene at that point, correct? There was not. Um, in fact, at that point, did you know where specifically on the property you were going to be searching? I did not. <clears throat> um, and in your experience, uh, is it proper procedure in an investigation that requires a search uh, for law enforcement to give up control of the area that will be searched? It's not unusual for us to respond to scenes like that, sir. Be it happens, but is it proper procedure, sir, to give if up control of an area to be searched prior to the search? If they don't think anything will be recovered in the meantime, sir, it's something we encounter all the time on our searches. Right. So in this case, uh, is it your testimony then that the investigators didn't think that anything would be recovered? Objection. I'll sustain the objection. All right. Well, you recorded that there was a second alert regarding this case at 2.53 p.m., correct? That, that was the initial alert, sir. Um, well, the initial, well, maybe we're getting into semantics here, but you were first notified at 2.32 p.m. by Lieutenant Tully, correct? That's him calling me. The 2.53 alert is a sent out to my full team. Okay. That 2.53 alert is the second time that you're receiving information about this case, right? The first being 2.32 from Lieutenant Tully. No, that's not new information. That's me taking the information I received from Lieutenant Tully and sending it out to the rest of my team. Okay. They, had, they were not aware of the the circumstances yet. So, so you were the one to send out that second alert, or that alert? At uh, West team supervisor, because I was going to start clearing my driveway, so I reached out to a, a West team supervisor. He sent out that alert. And who was that? That was then Sergeant, now Lieutenant Simpson. Okay. And the alert that Sergeant Simpson sent out was an, an instruction for members of your team to begin clearing off their cruisers and their driveways to get ready to go, correct? That was an availability of alert to see who, was, who would be available to respond. And that they should begin clearing off their cruisers and driveways, correct? Yes, so they would be able to respond. All right. But your team was still not activated at that point, correct? Correct. In fact, uh, Sergeant Simpson explicitly wrote in that alert, quote, we do not have the green light yet, end quote, correct? Correct, sir. Sergeant Simpson at 2.53 p.m. in that alert actually typed it in twice that your team did not have the green light, correct? Correct. It's a voice generator response that will normally duplicate the instructions. So as I listen to it, if they miss it the first time through, they, they can hopefully hear it clearly the second time through. Okay. Um, and it was very clear that you didn't have the green light from that alert, correct? Correct. So we weren't authorized to respond yet. Okay. Now... You stated that you were in Massachusetts at the time you were first contacted, correct? Yes, sir. And how far were you from Canton? Uh, normally it would be about a 20-minute ride. All right. With the blizzard conditions, however, it took, took you longer than that? 43 minutes, sir. Now, the, uh, in the, the, you're familiar with the CERT administrative journal extract? The Daily, jo Daily Journal, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, that recorded, and when I say that, I mean, you, you called it the Daily Journal? 
Yes, sir. All right, I'll call it the Daily Journal. Um, that Daily Journal recorded the initial contact that you had with Lieutenant Tully at 2.32 p.m., correct? Uh, yes, that was entered into the Daily Journal. And then the second entry was the 2.53 p.m. alert that was sent out by Sergeant Simpson, correct? Yeah, I'm not sure if that's in the Daily Journal or not, but that would be the alert, sir. Um, may I approach the witness, please? Yes. Um, Your Honor, I'd like to hand the witness this document and leave it there. I have an extra copy. I have no problem with him referring to it. Once you've had a chance to review that, uh, Lieutenant, if you look up at me when you're done. All, right. All set, sir. Uh, so you, you'd, you'd agree with me that the 2.32 p.m. phone call with Lieutenant Tully is in the Daily Journal, correct? Yes, it is. And the 2.53 p.m. alert uh, by Sergeant Simpson is also in the Journal, correct? Yes, it is. Both of those have a timestamp, do they not? They do, sir. What is the next entry on that journal? It says, sir, activated en route to Canton. Now, there is no time entry next to that. I'm sorry, no time is entered next to that entry, correct? There is not, no. Uh, the previous alert said only to clear the vehicles and driveways, essentially, right? To check on availability? Uh, correct, sir. Um, so the time that your team is alerted was entered in the journal, but there is no time entered in this journal as to when you were dispatched, correct? Correct, sir. But uh, you have a memory of after that 2.53 p.m. alert sent out by Sergeant Simpson that Lieutenant Tully called you back about an hour later? Uh, it's not a memory, sir. Our alert for the team to respond is time stamped at 3.48 p.m. Okay, and that, that was Sergeant Simpson that recorded that, correct? Correct, sir. Um, but that's not in the uh, Daily Journal, correct? No, that's in the Health and Homeland Alert Network, which, is our, which records all our alerts that get sent out, and that was time stamped at 3.48. 3.48, okay. Now, uh, other than authorization that would have been obtained after the 2.53 p.m. alert, um, did you ever ascertain what else changed on the part of the Norfolk uh, State Police Detective Unit that allowed you now to have the green light? Once I reached out, once I was done cleaning my driveway off, which took a significant amount of time, I spoke to my captain. He said we were approved on through our chain of command, and that's when either I contacted Lieutenant Tully or he called, called me. He said he was approved through his chain of command to include the deputy superintendent who was authorizing a response. Okay, so, so there's several layers of the chain of command that have to approve a response for numerous reasons. Staffing reasons, they know I'm only pulling, again, I said some of my team members aren't full-time members. Some of them I have to pull off their assignments, so if they're on patrol, I'll now be shorting a barracks. They take that into consideration, overtime consideration, safety consideration of now additional members driving through the weather to respond. So that all gets discussed at levels above us. All right. Um, that answer applied to strictly issues regarding authorization on both ends, correct? Uh, yes, sir. All right. You recall my question, which was other than authorization, did you learn what, if anything, had changed uh, in that time period from 2.53 p.m. to 3.48 p.m. on the part of the Norfolk State Police Detectives Unit? No, sir. We just talked about the authorization process. Um, so um, some, sometimes shortly before 4 o'clock, you're talking about 3.48 being the alert authorizing you to depart. Um, sometime before 4 Sergeant Simpson informed your team to start heading to Canton and to report to you, correct? Correct, sir. That meant that team members should basically stop what they're doing, the ones who are going to be going, um, get their gear ready, suit up, get in a car, and start driving to Canton to meet up with you, correct? Correct, sir. And we've already discussed that on this particular day with blizzard conditions and the roads as they existed, 
Um, that would act obviously take more time than it would on a clear, sunny day, correct? Correct, sir. And I believe your uh, estimation is maybe about a 20-minute drive in good weather uh, with good roads versus the 43 minutes it actually took you to get there, correct? Correct. <clears throat> now, the seven members of your team who did show up were uh, Bearden, Beausoleil, Carrier, Louise, O'Brien, you, and Viscardi, correct? Correct, sir. Uh, you all arrived at about the same time, sir? No, we had a pretty significant difference between arrival times. Okay. Uh, is there a something called a personnel status report that records arrival times, sir? No, it doesn't record arrival times. We just enter who's responding. We use our geotab, which is our vehicle locator, to determine arrival times. Um, so <coughs> is it your testimony? I'll just get back to the podium. <coughs> Is it your testimony that the personnel status report does not record the date and time that somebody arrived on scene? No, that's all manually entered, sir. Uh, do you deny that the personnel status report in this case recorded the date and time of each of those officers that I just mentioned uh, who came on scene? It has who arrived on scene, yes, sir. Um, but it doesn't just say who arrived on scene. The personnel status report says when they arrived on scene, correct? Yeah, it's whenever they would have been entered into the system. But that doesn't mean they were officially on scene yet, All sir. Right, but again, that's not what the document says, right? It doesn't say uh, we're entering this into the system because they're arriving. The document says on scene and it gives a date and time, does it not? Yes, it does, sir. Now, your testimony is, oh, and by the way, the personnel status report, you'd agree with me, has everybody except for you and Beausoleil showing up at 5 p.m. on January 29th of 2022, does it not? Yes, it does, sir. And it has you and Beausoleil showing up five minutes before that at 4.55 p.m. on January 29th, correct? Correct. Uh, but it's your testimony that when you got there, it was just you and Beausoleil, correct? Correct, sir. Which actually would be consistent with the personnel status report, right? Yes, sir. Because that has you two showing up first as well, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and then your testimony is that uh, other members didn't show up until between 5.20 and 5.24 p.m.? Uh, Trooper Bearden arrived at 521. Sergeant Luis and Sergeant O'Brien arrived at 524. Trooper Viscardi showed up at 534. Sergeant Carrier showed up at 541. Okay, and so the last member of your team, uh, which is, uh, again, Carrier? Carrier, correct, sir, 541. Uh, he showed up at 541, and now your team was all there, correct? Yes, sir. Um, so is it your testimony that uh, you did not meet up as a team somewhere and head to 34 Fairview? You all arrived individually? That's correct, sir. Uh, did every single trooper who arrived have their own cruiser? Uh, yes, they did, sir. All right. Now, you would agree with me that when Lieutenant Tully first contacted you at 2.32 p.m., it was still daytime, correct? Yes, it was. So it, it was light out, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you'd agree with me that at, at around 5 o'clock on this late January day in Massachusetts, it was dark out by the time you got there, correct? Yes, it was. So when you finally arrived on scene uh, after getting your team getting the green light, it was dark for the start of your search, correct? Yes, it was. When you got there, you set up a command post. Oh, you could call my cruiser command post, sure, sir. Well, I didn't use the term command post, sir, did I? You did who, not. Who used it first? We marked my cruiser as a command post on the map, sir. Okay, all right. Uh, and uh, a command post is a base of operations at the scene, correct? Yes, sir. And you parked your cruiser uh, basically in front of the driveway at 34 Fairview to 
serve as the command post? Yes, uh, right, right side of the driveway, yes, sir. And uh, you were initially facing away from the flagpole when you did that? Yes, sir. Which would mean that your cruiser was parked technically on the wrong side of the street facing Cedar Crest because you were against 34 Fairview? Correct, sir. Uh, and then ultimately turned it around? Well, yes, myself and Trooper Boussoulet moved our vehicles. All right, and um, you initially parked there uh, in part because you wanted to keep the area where you were searching clear of vehicles, correct? Uh, yes, sir. And that was where you met at the, uh, we'll call it a command post because, because you did, your, your cruiser. That was where you met to discuss the parameters of the search? When tell, uh, Detective Lieutenant Tully arrived on scene, that's, that's where we spoke. Okay. And you would agree with me that it was Lieutenant Tully from the Norfolk State Police Detectives Unit who told you uh, where to look and what to look for, correct? Correct. He told us the area he thought would be the best probability to find what we were looking for. In addition to your team, the, the seven of you, uh, you noted that there were five other officers on scene at various points, correct? Yeah, I believe it was about five, sir. They were all in uniform? They were not. Some were in plain clothes? They were. And you didn't know who those five other officers were, correct? I only recognized two of them, sir. And so the, the other three, you didn't know if they were state police or Canton police? Correct, sir. At that point, were you made aware that the Canton police had been conflicted out of this investigation? I had not, no, sir. All right, now, Lieutenant Tully directed you to an area where he said that John O'Keefe's body was found, correct? He directed us to where he believed the vehicle involved had been parked and to where the, the victim's body was recovered. All right, so again, in answer to my question, he did direct you to an area where he believed the victim's body was found, correct? Yes, sir. And he told you that he believed that the uh, victim officer was hit and dragged by a motor vehicle, correct? Yeah, I believe he might have said possibly dragged. All right, but in terms of your paperwork on the case, uh, there's something called a final mission report, correct? Yes, there is, sir. And what is the final mission report? That's just a brief summary of the actions conducted by CERT during our assignment. And uh, with regard to, just going back for a second, with regard to those five officers, you, rec you, you mentioned that you recognized two of the five officers that were in plain clothes at the scene? Correct, sir. And what departments were they from? The only two I recognized were from the state police. Okay. Now, getting back to the final mission report, um, you called it a brief summary of what you had done with regard to the search, correct? Yes, sir. Just because it's brief doesn't mean that it should be inaccurate, correct? Correct, sir. Um, it's important with regard to anything that you submit on this case that you be as accurate as possible, correct? Yes, sir. And you try to be, correct? Do our best, sir. Right. Uh, and there is an entry, uh, well, there are six different categories on, or I should say seven different categories on the final mission report. Uh, the first being the mission name, which you entered as the Canton Evidence Search, correct? Yes, sir. And that was accurate. Can't, the evidence search occurred, and it occurred in Canton, correct? Yes, sir. And you also put the date and time of the first call, and you entered that as January 29th of 2022 at 2.32 p.m., correct? Yes, sir. And that was accurate, because you've testified that's when Lieutenant Tully contacted you, correct? Yes, sir. And there's a entry or a question or a box that says general terrain, and you entered that as neighborhood, snow-covered street, and front lawn, correct? Correct, sir. And that was accurate, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and in terms of incident type, you entered evidence search, correct? Yes, sir. And that was accurate, correct? Yes, sir. And then there's a final mission report that 
talks about your mission and starts with you know seven CERT members, and that's the CERT team, right? Yes, sir. Seven CERT members responded to the scene, and it talks about um, you know the, the snow in the area where the victim's body was found, the, the plows hadn't cleared the street, et cetera, et cetera. That paragraph is accurate as well, correct? Yes, it is, sir. And then there's a final mission report by, and it gives your name, Lieutenant Kevin O'Hara, and it has your accurate badge number, which is 3042, correct? Yes, sir. All right, everything in that we've just discussed in terms of what you put in your final mission report was entered accurately, correct? Yes, sir. And the final category is general description of mission, and would you agree with me that you entered the off-duty officer was hit and dragged by a vehicle at approximately 12.30 a.m.? I don't remember exactly how it's worded, sir. If I could... May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Um, it's been a recurring theme. Do you need... Uh, I do not. Glasses? You I do not, okay. sir. All right, I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. All set, sir. Thank you. I may approach you. Yes. Uh, Lieutenant, having read that portion of the final mission report, um, is your memory refreshed? Uh, yes, it is, sir. All right. And did you enter in there the off-duty officer was hit and dragged by a vehicle at approximately 12.30 a.m.? Uh, yes, it is. I did, sir. All right. Now, with regard to the area that, or I should say, Lieutenant Tully's direction to you to search the area where the victim's body was found, um, Lieutenant Tully never informed you that he was actually present and saw the victim's body in that spot, did he? He did not, no, sir. Um, did you mark the place where John O'Keefe's body was found with GPS coordinates? Uh, we did not, he wasn't no longer on scene, sir, so I think that would have been not 100% accurate. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, Lieutenant Tully directed you to the area where the SUV had been parked, correct? To where the vehicle was believed to have been parked, yes, sir. All right. At that time, did you know it was an SUV or not? I did not, sir. All right. But in any case, uh, Lieutenant Tully didn't tell you that he ever saw the vehicle parked in the area to which he directed you, correct? He did not say that he saw it there, no, sir. So Lieutenant Tully told you to look for a man's sneaker, correct? That was one of the items missing, yes, sir. And he told you to look for red and clear plastic pieces of uh, taillight, correct? He just said taillight, didn't say red, red clear, but taillight pieces. Okay. Uh, did Lieutenant Tully give you approval not just to search outside the house, but also inside the house? No, we never discussed searching inside the house, sir. And you had mentioned during your testimony that um, you confirmed that the homeowner was there, right? Because he came out of the house at one point? I don't know if it was the homeowner, but an adult male exited the house while we were there, sir. Sure. Uh, and he, he appeared to live at that home, correct? Let me just a moment. All right. Now, uh, with regard to the area that you were searching, you would agree with me that Lieutenant Tully was the one who directed you where to search and what to search for, correct? He gave us the best idea for the search area, sir. All right, and it was based on his direction that you created a grid and began your search. He told us where he believed the vehicle was parked and where the victim's body was found, and I decided 
how far of a distance we would search. Okay. So that's another way of saying it was based on his direction that you created a grid and began your search, correct? Yeah, I based it off of the information he provided, yes, sir. So the answer is yes? I guess so, sir. Um, this was not the first time that you and your team have done a search in the snow, correct? Not for evidence. We had never done a search like this before, just for uh, missing person searches. I see. But in any case, you've been trained to search winter crime scenes that have snow, correct? Correct, sir. There are proper techniques for conducting such searches during or after a snowfall, correct? Yeah, we have best practices we use. I'm sorry, I didn't hear Yes, that. we have best practices we use, sir. Of course. Uh, best practices would include documenting the scene and the area to be searched with <coughs> photographs and diagrams, correct? Uh, yes, sir. It would also include using you know, gentle methods to remove snow, correct? Yeah, the best, most, best way you can, yes, sir. That might include, you know, smaller hand tools, brushes, gloved hands? Uh, only if you would have a real small area. Uh, it would include removing snow layer by layer and then sifting it and documenting evidence again for each layer that's removed? Yeah, I believe that's, that's how we went through, sir. We went slowly methodically and sifting through the snow as we progress down the area, correct. And, and best practices would mean documenting by photographs along the way the progress of your search, would it not? Uh, that would be up to the detectives or the crime scene unit, sir. Well, but you were the one who was making those decisions, correct? Not for documentation purposes, no, that's not our responsibility, sir. Okay, uh, but you would agree with me that um, that would, it would be advisable to document your search in that way, would it not? Uh, that would be at the discretion of the detective, sir. Okay, well, um, would it harm your search in any way to fully document it along the way? It would not harm it, no, sir. You wanna take your time and work methodically and thoroughly in the search, correct? Correct, sir. And you wanna collect evidence as it's located and immediately photograph it in place before it's disturbed, correct? Yeah, as evidence is discovered, it will get photographed in place, yes, sir. Uh, during your search in this case, your team found a sneaker and pieces of red and clear plastic, correct? Correct, sir. The evidence that you found was basically on top of each other, within a few inches of each other, correct? Uh, within a foot or two, a couple feet, yes, sir. Well, um, you testified at a prior proceeding in this matter, did you not? I did, sir. And you were sworn to tell the truth during that prior proceeding as well, correct? Yes, sir. And that testimony was closer in time to the search that you conducted on January 29th than today is, correct? Uh, yes, it was, sir. And your memory would have been better then than it is today, correct? Probably, sir. You were asked the question, quote, and as far as the red and clear glass you believed consistent with taillight, was that found in the same area as the sneaker or somewhere else? Do you recall that question? I believe being asked that question, yes, sir. And your answer was same area within a few inches less than a foot, correct? Correct, sir. Um, now, you mapped out GPS coordinates for what you found? Uh, one of the team members did, yes, sir. Your team did? Yes, sir. Uh, and Lieutenant Tully from the Norfolk uh, State Police Detective Unit was present during the search, correct? Uh, yes, he was. And he was the one that were, was photographing the items that were found? Uh, yes, he did. So I'd like to ask you a few questions about your observations about where these items were found in relation to each other. Uh, would, was there a piece of red plastic located on the roadway left of the flagpole when you look at the house from the street? Left of the flagpole, yes, sir. All right. Now, 
Given your testimony about these items essentially being in the same area less than a foot away from each other, um, it could not be true then that from that red piece of uh, plastic that, that was found in the street, that three feet south of that was uh, a black Nike sneaker found under the snow. That couldn't have happened, correct? Well, I don't know where the distance between the objects as far as the mapping pur purposes, sir, but as far as how far apart, the first, the first thing we discovered was one red piece of plastic, and then further south, that's when we found the sneaker and additional pieces. Right, but, but again, they were all in the same area less than a foot apart, correct? The same general area, but could have been over a foot, sir. I'd have to measure between the GPS markings. Okay, well, uh, so... Is your testimony today that what you testified to in that prior proceeding, where everything was less than a foot apart, that's, that wasn't accurate? Objection. Allow it. Is that your testimony, sir? Best recollection that they were with close within around a foot, but to be 100% accurate, you would have to measure between the two GPS points, which I have not done. Sure. But... If, if your estimate is they were, you didn't even say a foot, you said less than a foot, correct? I believe that's what you read around a, around a foot, yes, sir. Which is what you testified to, correct? Correct, sir. So if it's less than a foot, then by definition, the, the sneaker couldn't have been found three feet south of where that red piece of plastic was, correct? Yeah, and I don't know if that's accurate, sir. You don't know what's accurate? Well, you're saying three feet. I don't know if that's accurate, sir. No, that's what I'm asking you. Is it accurate? Oh, I, oh, I don't know, sir. I'm not sure the exact distance. I didn't measure the uh, GPS markings, sir. I'm not... All right. I, I don't know. Where, I didn't know where you came up with that number three feet, sir. I'm just asking questions. Okay. That'll be... Well, I'm just asking questions. All right. So, uh, with regard to... Let, let's, uh, let's assume for a moment that the sneaker was found three feet south of that first red piece of plastic. Um, from your observations, was there a clear piece of plastic that was found a few feet south of that black sneaker? There was a piece of clear pa plastic found just past the sneaker. A few feet south of the sneaker? I don't know where you're getting that from, I, sir. Again, you don't have to, like, Worry where my questions are coming. So, from. Mr. Yanetti, no comments. Next Four. question. I'm just asking a factual question. You were there. I was not. Mr. Yanetti, just ask the yes. question. Um, was a clear piece of plastic found a few feet south of the black sneaker, which was found three feet south of the red piece of plastic? Did was, that happen? I don't know the distance, sir. No, not without not without measuring it. But I wouldn't I wouldn't think it was that far of a distance. They were almost they were much closer than that. Right. I mean, you, you say you don't know the distance, but you testified to what the distance was in in that prior proceeding, did you not? Objection. Next question, please. All right. And then moving along, we have the red piece of plastic. Three feet south, black sneaker. A few feet south, clear plastic. Then finally, several feet south of that clear piece of plastic, was there a second piece of red plastic found? Several feet south. No, again, I don't agree with your description of the distance, sir. Okay. All right. So we will agree that, uh, you know, one piece of red plastic three feet south sneaker, a few feet south, south clear piece of plastic, and then several feet south more red plastic. That didn't happen, correct? I don't agree on those distances, no, sir. No, okay. Now, um, you testified that these items were buried under some snow, correct? Correct, sir, they were under snow. Can I have those exhibits, please? Okay, 
Can I, um, can I display exhibit 113, please? Um, all right, uh, we need, the jury needs to take a break. Why don't we oh, take, sure. why don't we have this down in the morning? All rise for the court, please. All right, Ms. Tinetti, you can go back to the podium. Lieutenant O'Hara, you testified on direct examination that you collected six or seven pieces of plastic, correct? I believe that's what we found, yes, sir. Uh, would you agree with me that it's important to be precise in your investigation and your search? Yes, why Lieutenant Tully took an evidence log, sir. All right. Uh, so as you uh, testify here today, two and a half years later, can you tell the jury whether it was six or seven uh, of the pieces of plastic that you actually found? I've never seen the evidence log from that night, sir, so I'm not sure exactly how many he recovered. Again, I was partaking in the search, so I'm not sure what the exact number is, sir. And you would agree with me that you only mapped three of them on the map that was introduced here at trial, correct? Correct. And again, that was because they were, the pieces were essentially on top of each other, correct? Correct. As you would mark them on the GPS, they were marking almost directly on top of each other, and we knew that was going to... Okay. And they certainly were not being marked feet away from each other, several feet, correct? No, sir. All right. And you are aware that Lieutenant Tully photographed five pieces of plastic that day, are you not? I'm not sure. I'd never seen the photos until probably about a week ago, sir. All right. In any case, you did say to the state police detective unit at the end of this search um, that if they wanted you and your team to come out back out during daylight hours, you would, correct? Correct, sir. So I'd like to direct your attention to six specific dates, and then I'll, I'll ask you a question. February 3rd, February 4th, February 8th, February 10th, February 11th, and February 18th, those six dates. And my question is, did the lead investigator, Trooper Michael Proctor, ever call you on one of those six dates to come back to the scene to conduct a further search? Uh, no, he did not. I have nothing further. Okay. Redirect, Mr. Lally. Just briefly, Your Honor. So, Lieutenant O'Hara, with respect to both uh, yourself, um, and uh, Lieutenant Tully, as far as being dispatched, that decision comes from above both of your heads with respect to each of your units. Is that fair to say? That's correct, sir. Now, you were asked some questions about a daily journal. Um, can you describe for the jury sort of what that is or, or what kind of information would typically be kept in that? That would just be our day-to-day -day activities. We'll give a quick gist of what we're doing each day. It'd be more general than that doesn't get too thorough. Now, you had made mention uh, during your testimony of some other, um, uh, some other documentation is, uh, that would be more specific. Is that correct? Correct, sir. And, and what would some of those be, and, and how would that be more specific? That's a report that gets generated through our mission manager software, so it creates a little bit more detailed response. And are you familiar with an AVL? I am, yes, sir. And what is an AVL? It's the uh, Geotab GPS on the cruiser's automatic vehicle locator system. And the vehicle that you were operating that day, was that equipped with an AVL? Yes, it was, sir. And is that how you're able to tell the precise time of your arrival on scene? Correct, sir. As well as each member of your unit, is that correct? Correct, sir. Now, as far as the items and, and where they were, uh, again, I just asked from the photographs that were marked as exhibits before, where the items were when they were located by members of your team, they were photographed as they lay, is that correct? Correct, sir. As they were discovered, they were photographed. So regardless of inches versus feet versus whatever distance it was, uh, you didn't measure that, is that correct? We did not, no, sir. But as far as uh, where they were actually discovered or where they were recovered, they were photographed where they were when you found them, correct? Correct, sir. Okay, perfect. All right. All right, Lieutenant, you are all set, sir. Thank you, Ron. Thank I appreciate you. it.
There you have it. For more on the case against Karen Reed, there are links in the show notes to our continuing coverage of this case. And you can see me on my show, Closing Arguments with Vinny Politan, every weeknight at 8 p.m. Eastern, where we dive deeper into the latest and breaking true crime stories. Thank you so much for downloading. And as always, please don't forget to hug the kids. This podcast is a production of Court TV. Go to CourtTV.com for more content, trials on demand, and to find out how to watch Court TV in your area.